Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Eunice Mathis. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm also the owner of Florida Training Academy. In today's video, we're going to just review quickly the SVT, the um, tachycardia station with the ACLS algorithms. My goal is to make you more comfortable with running codes. Remember, if you can remember your drug and energy selections, that means that you're going to help improve patient safety. And don't be so reliant upon, you know, the rapid response teams, because if they're with a sick patient who is critical, I need for you to be able to assist to handle your patient's emergency until those other events or um, providers arrive. And so with the SVT algorithm, which I'll try to have over here on the other side of the screen, um, you have to know what SVT is. And then you have um, PSVT, which could be heart rates greater than 200. With the American Heart Association, you want to treat anytime someone has symptoms. So symptoms could include chest pain, palpitations, low blood pressure. If the systolic blood pressure is less than 90, we're going to have to, you know, treat. And we may stop using medications at that point and think of what we really need to use in order to um, stop or decrease the chances of this person going into an arrest state. So if you find that medications aren't working, but the blood pressures are still decreasing, let's go ahead and use that energy. And so for this particular scenario, which I've not read for you, it's just showing you the monitor and we're going to run through this as quickly. We have a patient whose heart rate is 200. It's a narrow complex and our temperature is 98.3. Um, as soon as you see this on a monitor, you already want to be getting your team involved. And so when your team comes to the room, even though we may not need a compressor, we may not need someone to manage the airway, you at least want to be thinking of that because if we don't get this heart rate under control, our patient could go into cardiac arrest. And so if you have your CNA at the bedside, what role, what task would you delegate to a CNA or a patient care tech? And if you said vital signs and to go get that crash cart, you're absolutely correct. So here, let's get some vital signs on the monitor. All right, and so I'm going to pause it just so we don't have to speak past beeps. Right now we have a heart rate of 200. Our temperature is 98.3. Our patient's current blood pressure is 108 over 60, which means he or she is still compensating. Our O2 sat is 92%. Our respiratory rate is 28. Per, I'm sorry, respiratory rate is 28. And for video purposes, I'm teaching in silos, but in the real world, we'll be doing multiple tasks, multiple assessments at once. And so we have this basic information while the CNA is getting this, I need to be doing a brief and focused assessment on your patient. That assessment will include what symptoms are they having. If the heart rate is 200, more than likely they're feeling palpitations. They may feel some anxiety, shortness of breath. Look at the O2 sat being 92%. And if the blood pressure continues to decrease due to the low cardiac output, the heart's beating way too fast for there to be a sufficient amount of blood flow. And don't forget that um, the, the oxygen is carried in the blood. So if the heart's beating so fast, eventually this patient's going to be dizzy. So this patient's automatically a fall risk. Get them in the bed <laughs> and be prepared for an IV. If this person does not have an IV already infusing, you want to go ahead and be thinking about that. Right now, you may have it at just KVO or about 20 mLs per hour, just to make sure we have a patent IV. But if this person's um, SVT or if their symptoms continue, out after using the vagal maneuver, we know that we're going to have to give a medication. So I'm going to go ahead and resume this. We have our current vital signs. We have as many team members at the bedside as we need, and you can call out multiple orders at once. For a heart rate of 220 and a patient who is compensating, you can ask the person the vagal. And so we're going to say at 1342, vagal maneuvers were attempted and they were not effective. You asked the patient to bear down and he or she did so without any effect on the heart rate. We do not want this person's blood pressure dropping much lower. So if we have a patent IV, what medication according to the ACLS algorithm would we give if a person has symptoms or if they have unstable tachycardia? And so the medication we'd be given would be adenosine if it's a narrow complex tachycardia. How many milligrams would you administer? 
If you said six milligrams, you're absolutely correct. Now, I need for you to educate the person who's going to be pushing the medication as well as educating the patient. And so if you remember anything about adenosine, you know that it has a short half-life. So you have to push it fast, followed by a fast flush. If you just push it fast and don't flush behind it, the medication is going to stay in the IV. So we want to make sure we push fast, followed by a fast flush, because this patient, this medication has a short half-life. And since it does have a short half-life, meaning that by the time the medication gets to the heart or reaches the heart, it may be ineffective, you want to make sure that your patient has an IV that's more central, maybe in the left antecubital, as opposed to lo losing, um, excuse me, as opposed to using an IV that could be in the right hand. So make sure your patient has a patent IV that is large bore. Now, let's talk about what education we need to be giving to the patient. Because if we're pushing adenosine, a medication that's going to slow his or her heart rhythm, you may want to let your patient know that they're going to be feeling some, you know, it could be possible that they feel nauseated, that they could feel some flushness, maybe a little bit of chest discomfort, but you want to be there, hold your patient's hand and let them know that you're going to be right there with them and that you've given this medication before. You have a full team around you to support you. And um, of course, if anything goes wrong, you would be right there. Always have the crash cart there if you're pushing adenosine. So we have our adenosine, six milligrams that we have given, our O2 set, 92%. Um, I'm borderline on this right now. I'm going to go ahead and put maybe a nasal cannula on, about two or four liters. And if the O2 set decreases any further, that's when I'll switch to a non-rebreather. But the goal would be to maintain an O2 set above 94%. Right now, the heart is, the cardiac output is low. Once the cardiac output improves, then the O2 set will improve also. All right, so we're going to be pushing the adenosine followed by flat, a fast flush at 1344. We've educated our patient. We made sure we had a, an IV in the left antecubital area. And now that the atropine has been given, what do you do? If you're just staring at the monitor, <laughs> we want to make sure that you actually treat your patients. We treat patients, not monitors. So once you give that medication, you want to go back and reassess your patient. All right. And so we said when we give adenosine, sometimes the heart rate could slow. For our classroom purposes, we did not show the slow heart rate, but usually the slow down drastically. And if it works, the heart rate will normalize. In our case, it did not work. And so I want you to go back and reassess your patient. You're going to do that focused assessment again. Check on level of consciousness and also repeat a blood pressure. At this point, our blood pressure is starting to lower, even with saline infusing. If you're going to give a bolus of fluid, I want you to be monitoring for fluid overload. Whenever you think of fluid overload, immediately a lot of caregivers think about dependent edema, the leg swelling. Well, that is late stage. If this person has a history of um, congestive heart failure or maybe pneumonia, you want to be making sure you listen to those lung sounds um, because if we give too much fluid too rapidly, we'll be fixing one problem and causing another. And so make sure you listen to the lung sounds. You can also look for jugular vein distension. Those are usually like the early stages and that pedal edema would be late stage. All right, and so now we have our O2 at four liters. Our O2 sat is 94%, which is why I hit it. Our patient's still awake, alert, talking to us. However, the heart rate is now decreased. Excuse me, the blood pressure is now decreased. And the SBP is now 98. What is your next treatment? We've tried vagal maneuvers. We've given adenosine six milligrams, followed by a rapid flush. What will be the next treatment based upon this patient's blood pressure? And yes, we've also sought expert consultation, but it's going to take a few minutes for that cardiologist to arrive or for the cath lab to be prepared for an, an ablation. So I need you to manage this on your floor until the other experts are ready. If you say I give adenosine 12 milligrams, you're absolutely correct. All right, what education do you want to provide to this patient who's awake and alert and talking to you? What education do you want to provide to the nurse who's pushing the medication? And so now we're going to say that we gave adenosine 12 milligrams at 1347, but we don't treat patients, excuse me, we don't treat monitors, we treat patients. So as soon as you give that medication, you go back and reassess your patient. And if you don't have your 
blood pressure cuff set for about every two to three minutes, you want to go ahead and repeat it now and get a new blood pressure reading. And our O2 set is still 94% on four liters of oxygen via nasal cannula. All right, so now our heart rate is 70, excuse me, our blood pressure is 78 over 40. So vagal maneuvers did not work. The adenosine also did not work. We need to prevent an arrest. Because the blood pressure systolic is less than 90, we need to be thinking of other interventions beyond besides medication. And so what I want you to, and if you think about some of the drips, the maintenance drips, those will take a while to come from pharmacy. So I need for you to use what's in your crash cart right now. And if the adenosine didn't work, what's on top of your crash cart is a device, um, your defibrillator, the manual defibrillator that also has a sink mode. Whenever you sink, we're gonna be using energy to fix an electrical disturbance. Right now, too many parts of the heart are just firing, which is why the person has this rapid heart rate. Whenever you use the synchronized cardioversion mode, you'll know that the energy selection would be synced to the tip of the QRS complex. In other words, that's where the, the shock will be given at the tip of the QRS complex versus on the S or the T wave. If you deliver energy, and you're trying to synchronize cardiovert someone, but you um, forget to press the sync button. Instead, you can actually deliver the energy on the S or the T wave and cause that person to go into a lethal arrhythmia. And so we're not trying to do that. We're going to go ahead and activate our sync mode. The American Heart Association has gotten away from telling you how many joules to use for synchronized cardioversion. The old rule of thumb was if it was a narrow complex SVT, we would use 120 joules. However, they now want you to refer to your manufacturer's guidelines. So if I'm saying anything that your company or that the manufacturer's guideline for your defibrillator, um, if they don't say what I'm saying, I need for you to go by what they say. And so I'm going to increase my joules to 120, narrow complex SVT. Remember, this patient is awake. We have fluids infusing for this blood pressure, but the blood pressure is going to continue to decrease as long as we have low cardiac output because the heart rate's so high. All right, so everybody's at the bedside. We're charging. What do we want our team members to do? All right, we're going to clear. Everybody's clear. One, two, three, shocking on three. One, two, three, shock. We don't treat monitors, we treat people. Okay, so after this shock, um, this right here line is not a good line, but for classroom purposes, you're going to see that the heart rate picks right back up again, just so that we can go ahead and retreat this patient. But All right, so great job, everybody. We delivered um, one synchronized cardioversion attempt at 120 joules, and now it looks like our heart rate has normalized. I can see P, Q, R, S, I can see all my complexes. However, we don't treat monitors, we treat patients. What information do I need to be seeing on this screen, and what questions would you be asking the patient? All right, so as far as the screen is concerned, if you said you wanna see a full set of vital signs, you're absolutely correct. Great job. And now our focused assessment. Remember, you'd have multiple people. Someone could actually be doing the vital signs while you're doing the focus history and the assessment on the patient. And so the questions would be the basics. Do you know where you are um, on a scale, you know, pain level of zero to 10? How bad is your pain right now? Because you did send 120 joules through this person's um, chest wall. So you do want to reassess and do a skin assessment. However, do not take those pads off right now, because just because we have stabilized the patient doesn't mean that our heart rate can't go back up again. All right, and so now you would get those orders, those maintenance orders from your physician. Hopefully the specialists will be coming soon because American Heart Association will always say to seek expert consultation, but I just want to repeat, I want to go back through it. If you have a patient who has unstable SVT and their blood pressures can 
can handle if you have enough time your first treatment is not a medication your first treatment will be vagal maneuvers the second intervention would be the adenosine six milligrams followed by 12 milligrams based upon the person's blood pressure if the blood pressure is still greater than 90 systolic well then you can give that second dose of adenosine however if the blood pressure is starting to decrease or if your patient's having symptoms related to having a fast heart rate that are worsening such as maybe some some um, level of consciousness decrease or some other changes. Maybe they're having more chest pain. You probably want to go ahead and do the synchronized cardio version. Remember, if you don't press that sync button, then of course, we're just going to be shocking, you know, on the S or the T wave and we can cause a more lethal arrhythmia. Well, everybody, this is Eunice Mathis with Florida Training Academy. I hope this little brief um, tutorial assisted you to help you run an unstable tachycardia station um, during one of your upcoming ACLS classes, and hopefully it'll make you more comfortable if you have a patient who has a fast heart rhythm or a heartbeat in the real world. Have a great day, everybody.